Welcome to the Sheridan Report, brought to you by MyBookie.ag. Make sure you go to TheGruelingTruth.net, click on the MyBookie.ag banner at the top of the page to get up to a $1,000 cash bonus back. Basically, 50% of whatever you put in will be given back to you by MyBookie.ag to bet on the site. Uh, you could also enter promo code TGT50 if you just go straight to the MyBookie.ag website. I am your co-host for the Sheridan Report, Mike Goodpasser. Right now, I'd like to welcome in my co-host, Bobby Sheridan. How you doing, Bobby? Mike, I'm doing great. And every time I hear the This Week in Baseball entry, intro, you know, I, I just love that. And, you know, it was when I was a kid, that was my favorite show, you know, to wake up and hear Mel Allen on Saturday, just see some of the highlights of the week, and, you know. I'm really glad you you let you pick that song. Oh, I, I love that song. Nothing like this week in baseball with Mel Allen. Um, all right, let's start off. What's your big picks NBA wise tonight, Bobby? Well, NBA, you know, we 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 uh, we're going to get back back on the horse today uh, with Miami Heat, but we'll talk about that in a second. Let's go over a couple little tidbits here with the standings as it relates to Miami and Detroit because that's who we like today in the NBA and. Miami is is in that eighth spot, and you know they've gone seven and three their last ten games. They are a solid basketball team and have been a solid team on the road all year. So there's going to be obvious reasons why we like them today. Uh, but they they really need this game. Uh, they're they're in the eighth spot, only a half game up on Orlando. It is in the loss column. They have 37 losses. Orlando has 38, so that's a positive. And right now they're just trying to hang on to that eighth seed and. I think they will, and if you've been listening to us the last month or so, you, you, you know why I do, and it looks like they're going to be playing Milwaukee, and it's not something they're going to want to be doing, you know, because Milwaukee tore them apart again last night, and they're obviously Milwaukee's sending the message, and Miami, I'm sure, is getting it, but it's on to the next day, and, and Miami all along has had their sights set on making the playoffs for Dwayne Wade. Uh, this is a big big thing for this team and these guys you know they love him and and they're playing really hard for him every night so the second of the back-to-backs is not going to bother them at all they're getting a point tonight at washington and washington's been a disappointment all year the wizards you know they, they caught a little bit of a fire ironically when they lost john wall mike you know john wall's their their all-star point guard and it it really made bradley beal the focus of the team, and it was actually a good move. It was, you know, it was a few months ago, but it's, it's the only really time when they caught fire winning and, and with the point spread, you know, and um, they're still favored tonight because they're 22 and 15 in home, but this is a team that's limping to the finish line, and I think Scotty Brooks is going to get fired at the end of the year. There's a good chance of that, and, and um, you know, we love Miami tonight. Uh, the fact that we're not going to hold that loss against them yesterday and we're going to focus more on the, how they've been playing uh, prior to yesterday's poor performance in Milwaukee. Well, hell, a lot of teams have had poor performances against Milwaukee. So let's come right back with Miami tonight over Washington, and they're actually getting a point. All right. What else you got? Well, we're going to go to the free play, which is already on the Internet. I, I just posted – or the web, the Twitter, I just posted that, and it's been on the website since last night. If you go on the website and you just – Right there on the front page, there's a button you would click, free play. It's already got it tomorrow, which would be today's free play. And it, it was, it's Detroit. Uh, Detroit uh, is is um, is going to Portland tonight. And, and um, Detroit's ready to play a big game tonight. Uh, Portland's missing one of their top three, McCollum, again. And so much is, weight is put on Lillard. And I think Detroit tonight can double gang up on him with – there are two point guards they use. They split time between Jackson and Ish Smith. And as long as Drummond and Griffin are doing their thing, Drummond and Griffin are two of the best, two of the top ten players for plus minus. So as long as those two guys get big minutes tonight, stay out of foul trouble and are doing their thing, they match up really well with Portland. And the and the line indicates that, Mike. They're only getting five. So this is a, a, a really low-key, nice spot for Detroit. And a little bit on the money line would probably be a good idea, too. All right, Bobby. Of course. We've got March Madness. What do you got for us there? <clears throat> well, you know, in March Madness, I you know, this is obviously the, the highlight of the day. And I've got two games, I think, 
are going to be a okay and I'll save the top play for last. So that means let's go to the earlier game, which is actually uh, Michigan. You know, Mike, Michigan from the, the Big Ten, which has been solid, uh, Michigan plays Florida, and Florida got the money here early. They got the action. The, the line I saw it open around seven, and it's now five and a half. And, you know, look, I'm not going to – Say that that's right or that's wrong but the bottom line is i love the fact that we're only laying five and a half right now with a team that i think is final four bound i think they're going to get through this regional and the thing about them is they they've got a lot so much size and they're so well coached and they have such a good steady point guard and and now they've got matthews and this was a guy who was out late in the year missed the final three to four regular season games was not near 100% for the Big Ten tournament. And extra week, comes into that first game of the night against Montana, he pours in over 20. That's the scoring punch they needed to go along with what they got. And what they got is pretty solid. They played great defense. They had that freshman, don't know how to pronounce the last name, but he's a left-handed shooter, big white kid who's a player. Uh, yeah, this kid's going to lead yeah, this kid's leading them to some good stuff. And it's a brand-new team, identity-wise, from last year. And they are they are going to get through this regional, I think. They're my pick. And I think they're going to um, be fine today. Now, laying the points, I'm not – you know, it, it tempers me for making them a top play. But I still like them a lot, and I put a nice, solid wager on them. So let's go with Michigan over Florida, now down to five and a half. And let's see if Matthews can get 20-plus again today. All right. What about and Minnesota? That, I know you like Minnesota today, too. I do. It's my it's my top play, Mike. And this is a game I really, really like. Uh, the line open 10, it's 10.5. And, and I, I think that's just, look, Michigan State has beaten them already this year, blew them out uh, at home. And it was after Michigan State had lost those three in a row in conference. And it was a really good spot for them that day. It was a blowout spot for them at home that day. So that's, that's fine. That game means nothing. It has no bearing on today's game at all. What I like about this though, is that they, these two teams meet again and they, they know each other so well. And I think Minnesota is in a great position here. You know, in that game, they only got only one of their three main scorers had any kind of a game. It was Cal sure. He scored seven, I believe, but the re- the other two scores for them, Murphy and Coffey, were held to nothing in that game. And and you know, the key to this is that Minnesota has caught some fire here now late in the season. They they found something in the Big Ten tournament. They're well coached by Patino, and now they're 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 playing in a venue that is really a home court advantage. You know, they they had the best support out of all the teams that played there there were four games there and they dominated the crowd and it's going to happen again and patino urged that to happen again and he spoke about how the fans there love the program and the university and it really spurred them on now you know what happened in that game was minnesota who is not an outside shooting team not a good three-point shooting team and we all know what advantage that brings to your team when you can shoot the three they made 11 threes against louisville it was their second best effort on the season in that category. Now, if you get them their ability to shoot threes, if they can knock a few of those down today, they're going to be really tough to blow out. You know, you're getting 10 and a half points in this game, and I actually think they're going to be in the last five minutes with a huge shot to win this game. Now, that worries me a bit actually winning it because you know what happens in the last three, four minutes is though, and that guard Winston, and they're going, they know how to win. But Minnesota is going to have a shot in this game to win late. That's my prediction. I think the 10.5 will be in the bank unless something stupid happens late where they get outscored like 13-2 the last four minutes or something. That's, that's the only way I see us not covering. I, there is no way Minnesota is getting blown out in this game. There's no chance of that. Yeah, in, I agree with play, you. You know what I mean? Like They're not going to be down 45-20 at half or something. No way. So I, I really like them, and and uh, I think Patino, this might be the biggest win in his career today. So a right. little bit of money. All right. Over four to one. Well, Bobby, I think that's all you got for us for today, correct? 
It is. It is, Mike. All right. So we're going to take and hear a word from mybookie.ag. Then we're going to come back and do a little on this day, which includes the 1963 national champion Loyola Ramblers and a fight that most don't remember between Larry Holmes and Ozzy Ocasio in 1979 for the World Heavyweight Championship. We'll be back in just a minute. Hi, I'm Mike Goodpasser from the Grueling Crew Sports Network, and I'm here with just one simple message. If you're watching the games, it's time to start making money. The Grueling Truth has recently partnered with MyBookie.ag, an industry-leading sportsbook website, who reminds you that where you bet is just as important as who you're betting on. And that's why The Grueling Truth urges you to check out MyBookie.ag. In addition to the usual thousands of odds, money lines, proposition bets, and futures offered on MyBookie.ag daily, they also have in-game live betting and a mobile site that makes wagering on the go easier than ever. So join now and my bookie will give you up to a free $1000 cash bonus on your first deposit. Just enter promo code TGT50, that's TGT50 to take advantage of this offer. You can also go to thegrillingtruth.net, click the banner at the top of the page for mybookie.ag and also get the same benefit and the same $1000 free cash bonus on your first deposit. So visit mybookie.ag courtesy of the grueling truth and enjoy winning today. MyBookie.ag, you play, you win, you get paid. All right, guys, we're back on the Sheridan Report, brought to you by MyBookie.ag. I'm Mike Goodpaster, sitting here with Bobby Sheridan. Bobby, what do we got for on this day? Uh, we got two good on this day, Mike. In 1963, today's the day, was the 25th NCAA Men's Basketball Championship in Loyola, beat Cincinnati, 60-58 in overtime. I got to hear about this. Um, actually, I think the most interesting things with this team happened before they got to the championship game. And on Tuesday, we're going to have Fred Mitchell, who wrote the definitive history of Loyola basketball, who will be on Surviving Advance at noon Eastern time with me and Steve to talk about this. But this Loyola Chicago team made it to the NCAA tournament. I think this was the first time they'd been there or the first time they'd been successful there. But their first round matchup. They beat Tennessee Tech 111 to 42, which is significant because I think to this day it's still the largest point margin in NCAA tournament history. The game that is interesting here is the second round game they played, which would be like the regional semifinal or the Sweet 16. They're playing Mississippi State. And the thing about Loyola is they started four black players. Now, there was a gentleman's agreement in college basketball back then that you would never start more than two. If you fell behind by like 10 points, you could put a third black guy in. But most people didn't play with more than two. George Ireland, who was the head coach of Chicago, Loyola Chicago, always started four because his four best players were African-American. Mississippi Governor Ross Barnett, who was a vocal segregationist, forbid the Bulldogs from even competing in this game against black players. And to make a long story short, Mississippi State had dealt with this for a while. And their fans and, you know, the athletic department and the school had grown tired of staying home while teams like Kentucky competed for trophies. Um, The university president at that time, I think, was Dean Colbert, who decided to allow the team to play in the tournament anyways. Even after Barnett, who was a Klansman, and the Mississippi governor, governor ordered an injunction that barred it from leaving the state. Now, Colvard, who was the president of the university, um, had a plan. And that was sending Joe McCarthy, not that Joe McCarthy, but <laughs> Joe McCarthy that was the head coach for Mississippi State. He sent him to Memphis. And he, he went to Alabama for a speaking engagement to avoid being served the injunction. An assistant coach sneaked players onto a plane, I think, in Nashville, where they re- reunited and flew to Michigan, where Loyal awaited to play them. Now, before the tip-off, one of the most iconic, maybe the most iconic picture in college basketball history is Jerry Harkness, who was the captain of the team, walking up and shaking forward Joe Dan Gold, who was the captain of Mississippi State's team. He walked up and shook his hand. The contest was played, no racial incidents. Um, Loyola won 61-51 to to move on to the Elite Eight. 
and there was no racial incidents, as I said. And when Mississippi State returned to the campus, I mean, they received a really welcoming, you know, crowd. Nobody was fired, and Loyola advanced from there to the Elite Eight, where in the Elite Eight they played Illinois, who was the Big Ten champion, and they beat Illinois seventy-nine to sixty-four. Now, when they go to the Final Four, they play Duke in the first round, and they blow out Duke 94-75. to Most people think that this is where this story is going to end, because Cincinnati, the University of Cincinnati Bearcats, Ed Thacker, I think was the coach at the time, or Jucker, I don't remember which one, but they were a loaded team who had won the national championship with a huge upset in 61 over Ohio State, beat Ohio State again in 62, and for an Indiana connection, Bobby Knight was on the 61 and 62 Ohio State teams that lost. But UC comes out wow. in the national semifinals and just buries a really good Oregon State team, 80-46. to 46. Nobody really gave Loyola any chance. And this is probably your first Cinderella story that people talk about where they come out and they hit a last-second shot to beat the University of Cincinnati 60-58. to 58. The sad thing about this is in the championship game, and this is not sad to me, but what I'm going to tell you afterwards is this. People overlooked the 63 game. Everybody reads in that at 66, all-white Kentucky team against the all-white Don Haskins-led Texas Western team as being what really wrote, broke the racial you know, barrier. But it's not because right. the 1963 game – Cincinnati actually started three black players. Loyola Chicago started four black players. Uh, that's seven. That's more than five. But it happened a few right. years before. But I think the reason it doesn't really stand out to people is is because Loyola Chicago wasn't really a elite university at that time, basketball-wise, and Kentucky was. Plus, you had all black guys against all white guys. But you pretty much had that when they beat Mississippi State. So I, I think the story here of Loyola Chicago and what they did to, you know, stop the racial segregation or to at least lend a hand right. into slowing it down was huge. And I think people lose that story, which is why we're going to have the guy that wrote that article on the grueling truth on Tuesday, Fred Mitchell, to talk about the history of Loyola basketball. Oh, Mike, that is. I knew nothing of what you were going to tell me, and that was just tremendous knowledge to, to learn. And Tuesday, I had no idea you were going to have him on. So this was a perfect lead-in for your show, and I had no idea about that. So that's really cool. All right. What else you got? See if I can come up with something well, else cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you will, <laughs> because 1979 – I know Larry Holmes, of course, and we've talked many times about him, and I, I love talking Larry Holmes stuff. But when I got when I read this one, I, I had no idea he TKO'd a gentleman by the name of Osvaldo Ocasio in seven for a heavyweight boxing title. I mean, I know I'm stupid when it comes to boxing, but I, I thought I had heard of most of the big guys. Who is Osvaldo Ocasio? Ozzy Ocasio was a guy that I think when he fought Larry Holmes was only like thirteen and zero. Um, Holmes beat Ken Norton to win the title June 9th, 1978, if I remember right. The thing that is interesting about that is on June 9th, 1978, on the same card on ABC Sports, it was a Saturday night. I remember watching it like it was yesterday. Jimmy Young was – Jimmy Young had lost to Ken Norton. On Ken Norton, Larry Holmes were fighting for the vacated title. The title was vi vacated because Leon Spinks had beaten Muhammad Ali in February of 78. Now, he was mandated to fight the number one contender, Ken Norton. He wouldn't do that because he said that he owed Ali a rematch because Ali was a legend. So they're going to fight the rematch in September. So in the meantime, Jimmy Young's told that if he fights Ozzy Ocasio and he beats Ozzy Ocasio, he will get a shot at whoever wins the Holmes-Norton fight. Now, in 1977... Norton and Young basically fought for that vacant title because they were ranked one and two, and it was a great fight, and Ken Norton won a close decision. So Norton was crowned a champion when Spinks refused to fight him. So Holmes beats Norton that night in a great fight. Ocasio, who nobody had ever heard of, upsets Jimmy Young. So Jimmy Young is still controlled by Don King. 
So they give Jimmy Young a rematch in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Ozzy Ocasio was from Puerto Rico. Ocasio beats him again. In the meantime, Holmes defended his title against Alfredo Evangelista. Uh, Evangelista was a guy that was not very good. Um, he was European. So it was basically an easy fight for Holmes. And then after that, they gave Ocasio the next chance. And they called Osvaldo Ocasio Jaws was his nickname. And they basically threw him to a shark because they put him in a heavyweight title fight. And the interesting thing about this fight, and this is free fight again, or on free TV, Ernie Shavers basically ended Ken Norton with a first-round knockout on the undercard, which led to Ernie Shavers then getting a shot at Larry Holmes. Now, they fought this at the Las Vegas Hilton Pavilion, which seated like five or 6,000, sold five or 6,000. But Ocasio was dropped four times in the seventh round. The first knockdown was from a jab, which you very rarely see a guy get knocked down from a jab. The next three, if I believe, came from right, right, punch, or right hands, and they stopped the fight in the seventh round. Holmes beats Ocasio, but Ocasio didn't really disappear. Ocasio fights a guy by the name of Michael Dokes in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Dokes is a young up-and-coming heavyweight, and they fought it in San Juan again, and Ocasio surprises everybody by fighting him to a draw. In the rematch, though, Dokes comes out more prepared, starts as even one you think that's it for Ocasio. Ocasio goes on to lose to John L. Gardner at Wembley, and Gardner was a guy who was not very good. Now, when you move on here, though, about this time, they create the Cruiserweight Championship of the World. And Ozzy Ocasio, when he fought Holmes for the title, only weighed like 200 pounds, so he was undersized. So when you go yeah. to the Cruiserweight title, um, the WBA first cruiserweight title fight was between Ozzy Ocasio and, Ro and Robbie Williams. The thing that works out there is Don King still controls Ocasio. So even though he got starched and won by Dokes and he gets knocked out by John L. Gardner, he gets a shot at this first cruiserweight title. And he wins a close, controversial split decision against Robbie Williams. Robbie Williams, if I remember right, was from like South Africa. And he beats Williams in South Africa. He went on to defend his title three times. And then he lost it to a guy by the name of Piotr Kraus in South Africa. That was another South African. And I still think Ocasio won that fight. But he didn't get the decision. But Ocasio goes on and fought Dwight Braxton. Who was by then in 1987 Dwight Muhammad Kwawi. Um, Braxton okay. had fought a super fight at the light heavyweight division. Was a great fighter. Um, and Ocasio beats him by a majority decision and wins or it, it gets a, wins an opportunity to fight Evander Holyfield for the WBA cruiserweight title. And he gets the shot at Holyfield. Holyfield stops him. But since he's got Don King in his corner, he still makes money. He fights a guy by the name of Pierre Cotsi, Cotsier, who was a heavyweight. And he moves up, and he actually pulls an upset and beats Cotier. Then he loses to Cotier. He goes on to fight Ray Mercer in 1989, and this was on the undercard of Duran Leonard three. And a lot of people thought Ocasio won this fight, but Mercer got the split decision. Um, after that, he fought Terrell Biggs, who was an Olympic gold medalist. He loses a unanimous decision. He fights Bruce Selden, who goes on to win a portion of the heavyweight title, loses a decision there. And in 1990, in Lennox Lewis's 11th fight in England, Ocasio actually went the distance with Lewis. So Ocasio's a guy that when you look at his record, it doesn't seem outstanding because he was 23 and 13 with 12 knockouts. But he's a man that after that Holmes fight went on to be a world champion in the cruiserweight division. He upset some guys that were really good. And then to show how much skill he had, he was still going the distance with guys like Ray Mercer, Tyrell Biggs, Lennox Lewis, and Bruce Selden 10 years, 11 years after he had fought Larry Holmes. So yeah, that's in the cool. end, he was wow. a good fighter. He just wasn't big enough to fight heavyweights. But that's the story of Ozzy Ocasio, and I think I know more about him than probably most of his family. <laughs> well, it sounds like it. Have you, inter have you interviewed him on the Legend Show, Mike? No, I don't even know where to – find him and i don't know if he speaks english i don't know whatever happened to him i would like to have him on yeah because i got to interview marvin camel 
Marvin Camel was the first man to ever be the cruiserweight champion of the world. And he was a really cool interview. And I, I like interviewing guys like that because guys like that were really talented. They were damn good fighters, but people just kind of forget about them. Yeah, and they're, they're going to tell you the straight stuff, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's uh, he would be a great interview. And how impressive for him to go on and accomplish some of the things he did. You know, that it shows you that he was a great, great fighter. Well, the problem is record. with him, people remember Larry Holmes. I mean, he flopped around like a fish out of water against Larry Holmes. He got knocked down so much. And then Evander Holyfield tore him up. And that's basically what people remember. The thing I remember, though, is sitting there as a 10-year-old watching him upset Jimmy Young and Howard Cosell screaming, he can't believe that just happened. And I mean, it's just it's just a good story. It's a story that gets overlooked. But Ocasio, it's just like 1963 Loyola. That should never be overlooked. The movie should have been made about Loyola. Yeah, wow. Well, you know, in, in Cincinnati, who, who was the, do you remember offhand, Mike, who was there on that particular team? Who was their star player? Oh, 1963 Cincinnati. Who was the coach yeah. of that team? Was it was it Thacker or Jucker? Who was well, I, I mean, I don't know. I, mean, that's, I don't know anything. I just know around that time they were great, and and I'm just wondering, you know, the star of that team in '63. You know, he didn't. Well, get the, the thing the about title. it is this: I mean, the guy that didn't get the title, and this is what's so amazing about this is the fact that they won back-to-back national championships after, you know. Oscar Robertson was gone. Um, You're right. But yeah, right. I'm pretty sure that the stars on that team were Ron Bonham, Thacker, and Wilson. And then there was a guy, you remember Tony Yates? He was the coach at UC that in 1983, he, he played stall ball against Kentucky at Riverfront Coliseum, and the Bearcats were down like 11 to 7 at halftime and ended up losing <laughs> 24 to 11. And then they asked Tony Yates after that, why'd you do that? And he said, because I didn't want to get beat by 100. So I figured we'd stay in the game. Uh, yeah, Ed Jucker, I'm 99.9% .9 sure, was the head coach of those great UC teams. They played in the Missouri Valley Conference. The thing I remember about Jucker is I remember going to the library in Aurora, Indiana, in like the mid to late 70s, and he wrote a book about the about his offense that he ran at UC, and he wrote like two or three coaching books on coaching basketball, and I read all of those books. And, yeah, I just looked it up. Ron Bonham, Thacker, and Wilson were the three studs. The, th the thing about them is all three of them averaged over 15 points a game, and then Tony Yates was a senior on that team, and Tony Yates was a hell of a player. Not a very good coach, though. Oh, okay. Well... That's good stuff, Mike. I appreciate hearing that, and, and uh, that'll take us right into today, and, and we'll see if some what's going to be written about today. But I have a good feeling about Michigan uh, continuing their run this year, and I have a really good feeling Minnesota may pull off an upset. So that's what, that's what I'm thinking there, Mike. All right, Bobby. Remind everybody, go to at Sheridan Report on Twitter. Go to SheridanReport.com on the Internet. Make sure you follow Bobby. Make sure you buy the Sheridan Report. It's just $10 a day, uh, $50 a month, and you get the sheet every day for that $50 a month. It's probably the best deal you can get out there. And once you do that, go to thegruelytruth.net, click on the mybookie.ag banner at the top of the page, and make some money. If you put in $1,000, you'll get an extra $500 to bet. Actually, you can go up to putting two grand in and getting a grand back, which will give you three grand in your account. So make sure you take advantage of that. I want to remind everybody that this weekend you can look forward to an Indiana-Arkansas post-game show as the Indiana Hoosiers beat Arkansas today to advance to the NIT quarterfinals. Um, tomorrow night we'll probably be looking at an Inside Boxing Weekly show. And then Monday, Survive in Advance with Brian Ralph from Fanside and Busting Brackets will be with me and Steve Risley to recap the weekend of college basketball to look ahead to the Sweet 16. On Tuesday, we will have author Fred Miller, who was the author of The History of Loyola Basketball, More Than a Shot in a Prayer, which will tell you all about the 63 team, all about last year's team um, that made the, you know, the miraculous Final Four run on Wednesday. We will have Max Lipister, who's an NFL agent, will be on the show. On Thursday, we'll have Bobby, Sarah Uran, and Graham McGowan from Out of Left Field 
to talk and preview the 2019 upcoming Major League Baseball season. And then Friday, we're going to do something. We'll figure out what it is when we get to Friday. We might talk <laughs> a little NBA with Cole Hanna. And we may have Anthony Servino on, talk a little NFL. So we may get about a half hour from each one of those guys. And then, of course, at 2 o'clock during the week every day, we will have the Sheridan Report live Monday through Friday. And next Starting on Monday, Monday through Friday, we'll have Inside Boxing Daily back live at 11 o'clock also. So we're going to wrap it up. I want to remind everybody, check out the Sheridan Report, mybookie.ag. You can hear all of our podcasts on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you hear sports podcasts, you'll find the grueling truth. So for Bobby Sheridan, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to the grueling truth where the legends speak.